first, before I mention anything else, let me bring up the cognitive phenomena known as confirmation bias. If you don't know what it is, let me give you a mini primer. Confirmation bias in a nutshell is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's own existing beliefs. So a rough example of that might be something like, if you believe vaccines cause autism or other uh, cognitive impairment, and it just so happens someone's child develops um, maybe some kind of a learning disability or something, but it isn't diagnosed until after they receive their inoculations, it might lead one to validate or feeling of validation regarding vaccines and developmental issues. Politics, um, politics, a lot of people think or are under the assumption that it has to do with policies. It doesn't. Policy is literally the last thing politics is about, which is why it's so inefficient and why, as I've said in other videos, this is why I advocate for systems of governance that utilize the tools of science such as some of the ideas put forward by organizations like the Zeitgeist Movement, or some of the things you might hear from someone like Peter Diamantis. Now, you know, I'm not saying they have it all figured out. What I am saying, all I'm saying, is that in order to get anything accomplished, we need a better approach than what we're using now, which is mostly just worthless, non-evidence-based opinions and appeals to emotion. So policy, as I said, is not the main driver of politics. If you do even the most rudimentary research, you'll find that military actions typically don't decrease when Democrats are in power, despite being the anti-war party, self-proclaimed, and Republicans, when in office, continue to tax and spend despite being the party of fiscally, fiscal responsibility and small government, self-proclaimed. Now, as far as bias goes... The reason why I'm making this video is because I see things that it seems other people are not seeing, or seemingly not seeing, because if they were, I wouldn't be making this video. Politics is not the main focus of my channel, although I do often cover political issues that I feel are relevant. My channel is sort of a collection of my varied interests, but since the hot topic right now is the presidential election, I'm going to point out what I think others may be missing. Most of my views are informed by all of the aggregated news sources that I, f I read on Twitter. Unlike most people, I'm very well aware of confirmation bias, which is why I go to great pains to mitigate it by following as many differing voices on Twitter as I can, and across the net. Because of which, Unfortunately, I'm often subjected to a lot of shit I'd, I'd really rather not see, or read, or watch. But I force it down because I want to know what the alt-right is up to. I want to know what the progressive left, so-called, a.k.a. the regressive left, as Dave Rubin, <laughs> his favorite word, to abuse. And I want to know all points in between because... Those are all real people who subscribe to these ideas, and they vote. So it's important to understand where they're coming from. Ideas I don't like, they don't cease to be simply because I close my eyes to them, or, <clears throat> or ridicule them. Let's move on to the meat and potatoes of this video, which is... Who gains the advantage in this election from rising third-party viability? And I'm gonna say Donald Trump. It's Donald, it's Donald Trump. Of course... I'm going to list the reasons why I think so, and also all the sources that lead me to this conclusion. I don't anticipate that Gary Johnson or Jill Stein will win the presidential election. Although, you know, feasibly they could, by some miracle. It's likely that they'll both swing the election in favor of Trump. It goes without saying that Jill Stein, as the only true leftist, the only true sincere liber liberal in the race will soak up burnouts and progressives. After the debacle at the DNC when Bernie was snubbed and the DNC leaks made it clear why he was snubbed, you know, Jill Stein's social media accounts blew up and her polling went up from something like 3% pre-DNC to uh, double that by some polls and nearly triple that 
by other polls. The Green Party is now reaching the level of support that the Libertarian Party was at during the 2012 presidential election. And the people she's gaining ground with is the far left. Much of Bernie's support was, is, whoever's still with him, actually further left than he was, than Bernie was. So they're right at home with Jill's message with the Green Party platform, which includes student, notably student debt forgiveness. You know, so Bernie's position more or less was making local and small kind of community college tuition affordable or state funded free quotes free. I know that's a word that many people refute and I, you know, duly so. Uh, so, But anyway, so Bernie suggested that, but eliminating all student debt, this is what Jill Stein is proposing and I'm pretty sure that's going to resonate with many millennials in a huge way. So there goes the youth voting block. Hillary's not getting any of that. And like it or not, and people are going to cringe when I say this, some people will, Donald Trump is the punk rock candidate. Many people <laughs> block me right away on Twitter as soon as I dare to suggest such a thing. But many young uh, boys who are naturally rebellious, you know, they find that the odd third wave feminist message or feminism, third wave feminism has demonized them for just existing. So for those those guys who are of voting age, maybe, you know, like se- between senior high school to 25, they see Trump in, a, in the same way that they would see a kind of Heath Ledger Joker. They see his way of doing things like the Heath Ledger Joker way of fucking shit up. His, bra- you know, brazen sort of uh, scorched earth style of campaigning it sort of parallels with that. And, you know, that looks cool. Like, oh, he gets on TV and he fucks shit up. And, you know, we like that. So I predict that a disproportionate swath of young male voters will turn out for Trump. And, you know, a few women too, but he's mostly captured that raw male frat boy punk rock energy. That brings me to Gary Johnson. Listen, I like Gary. I like much of the libertarian ethos, but that said, Gary has been acting very un-libertarian lately, and I understand why he's pandering, but I don't think the major media at large understands why. If you pay close attention, CNN and other major news outlets have been entertaining Johnson quite a lot lately, and their motives are, (laughs) as always, nefarious. They falsely believe that because he's the libertarian candidate, which is closely associated with Republicans, you know, because he and uh, his running mate, um, Bill Weld, are themselves both former Republican governors, he's going to skim off right-wingers. I'm pretty sure that's the working, kind of the working theory inside of these, uh, these media giants that are pushing Hillary or... You know, you can't come out and say that because it sounds conspiratorial, but uh, I, I th- I'm pretty sure that the DNC link, uh, leaks have cleared all that up. It's, there's no conspiracy here. The conspiracy is out in the open, <laughs> so we know it's truth. Um, <clears throat> so one problem with what they're trying to push. Johnson, for some reason, has been aggressively pandering to the left. To the left. Why he's doing that, I don't know. Uh, from you know personally it's a big reason why he's putting me off and i tend to be sort of left leaning on most issues i i want to like him but there's already a leftist candidate who i like and there's well there's already a leftist candidate period and it's jill stein and she's pushing the sort of left message she's hammering it harder than he could ever dream gary johnson is he seems presidential, and he's got a kind of a cool, laid-back vibe about him. And he's this is like a he's like an out or a, he's like a triathlete or something like that, and he climbs mountains. Like he's definitely got some like an an aura of kind of semi cool dude, but it's just he I don't know. There's something also very awkward about him. And anytime he's a he's a worse speaker than I am, and I know <laughs> how awkward I sound. So anytime I see him on, on TV and his message, like I said, because he's pandering to the left, just sounds off kilter. The libertarian message is appealing because it's libertarian, which many this is why many have criticized Johnson for not being a very good 
a very good one, a very good libertarian. And I thought at the time when I heard those criticisms, well, you know, pure um, libertarianism isn't likely to take hold in America anytime soon. And for a lot of reasons, you know, it's a little too, it's a too drastic, too dramatic if you were to really explain what the libertarians believe and, and pure libertarianism, you know, it's not likely to work in reality anyway. A, a pragmatic libertarian like Johnson is probably the best strategic choice for growing the Libertarian Party, but he's gone full pander, left hard mode. I don't know why. Oh, well, I know why. Again, he's trying to grow. He's he's trying to expand his base, but he's going to bring people in who are not. They don't understand the Libertarian standpoint well, and they're just going to approach it when they hear him say like, "Hey, you know," his. They're going to hear that side that's um socially liberal. And they're going to think like, oh, well, this guy is, you know, he's he's just like us. And then they're going to bring in all their, like, wacky, regressive left ideas. And it's going to spoil. They're going to put too much salt in the soup. You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You can make some concessions here and there. But um, he's going to end up destroying the Libertarian Party if he gains ground at this rate with the way he's behaving and, and this kind of the front that he's putting forward, which is strange. And anyway... There are many videos now on YouTube, which I'll link in the description of Gary. First of all, lavishing praise on Hillary. Why would you, you know, he's been so soft on Hillary. It's weird. He's been sweet on Hillary and it's weird. And he's meanwhile insulting Trump, but I'll get to that in a sec. So the, I'm going to link this in the description. Gary Johnson calling her uh, during, I think it was the first CNN um, town hall. And they've, they've had two. So again, that shows you, like I said, the CNN of all people, they're trying to put the libertarians out there because they think they're going to skim off Republicans off of... Then you're not going to touch Trump's heart and support. You're not going to fucking touch it. They, Those people will crawl hands and knees over broken glass to get to the, their local polling station and vote Trump. You're just not going to touch it. So Gary Johnson, he calls Hillary Clinton a wonderful public servant. Why would you do that? It's not true. <laughs> we know this is not true, especially... Why? Well, hey, I just... Anyway, facepalm. Yeah, because speaking well of Hillary worked so well for Bernie, right? So, second thing that I want to I wanna hit here after that is um, he's soft on Im immigration. Now, libertarians... That's, that's fine, actually, as for a libertarian to be soft on immigration because they believe in open borders. That's why, again, I say pure libertarianism. Uh, they believe that uh, the world should freely associate and trade and whatever else freely with as minimal of government. I think um, ideally no government. It's just vol pure voluntarism, which is a pipe dream. You know, this is why I said pure libertarianism. They it couldn't possibly exist in reality. I love their ideas. They have a lot of great ideas, but it, it just doesn't. It's It's not practical. A lot of it is we should reduce government as much as possible. That said, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't doubt that we'll someday arrive to a beautiful borderless Star Trek future where everyone works together for the benefit of mankind, and I hope for that, but we're certainly not there yet. Uh, so he's soft on immigration. He even got triggered, <laughs> which is really funny. He got really triggered recently in an interview, and again, I'll link this in the description over the word illegal immigrant, which um, certain groups of people are going to watch that. Which voter base is is his righteous in indignation likely to appeal to? The you know the Trump people who uh, he's, he's no no it's not. Which voter base is is he more likely to appeal to with that message? It's not going to be Trump people. It's going to be pe potential Hillary voters. Another thing he's been doing, liberally pun intended is insulting Trump every chance he gets to stand in front of a TV camera. Again, think about it. That's all I'm saying. I'm putting this out there. Think about the uh, information I'm putting out. He insults Trump. Who does that appeal to? You might say, oh, well, you know, that still endears him to some never Trump Ted Cruz conservatives, as <laughs> as the affection as they're affectionately known to alt writers, <clears throat> to which I say, no, not really. Uh, yeah, maybe some never Trump Republicans will go to Johnson, but the wealthier of the bunch are going to Hillary. This is obvious to those whose eyes are open to see it. Those who are aware of what confirmation bias is, which is why I, I opened this video with a, a small snippet of that to bring it full circle. And 
how to avoid succumbing to it and make unbiased observations like, you know, your humble narrator here. That is to say, moi. So there you go. Who benefits from third parties? Trump does. Trump benefits. He benefits because, you know, who's, well, who's get because who's getting Ralph Nadered in the ass? Hacking, phlegm, whooping cough, Hillary is. 